Well, it's true at the time that uh, Paul wrote the book of Galatians, and you can be turning there, chapter 2. What's true then is true today, and that is the core, the core truths of Scripture are under attack. They are always under attack. Satan's strategy from the very beginning was to confuse and corrupt and ultimately deny the truth. Uh, he, he throws in a little bit of fallacy to make that happen, but it started in the garden, and it continues today. But God has spoken in his word with clarity and finality. And we have a duty as followers of Christ to obey it, not only that, to defend and proclaim what is true. And, of course, the most crucial doctrine uh, in regard to the foundational doctrines of our faith is the doctrine of salvation. Now, there's an there's a old um, notion that's not very politically correct today, even among modern evangelicals, and that is that the truth is worth fighting for. Too many don't want to fight for the truth. They don't want to speak up against falsehoods. And I don't want us to be a people who just argue for the sake of argument. But when it comes to biblical truth, we're not talking about trivial or unimportant issues. When it comes to to biblical truth, it's not just academic. We're talking about the conflict between truth and error. And just as it was in the first century, taking a stand uh, for truth and confronting error head on is unpopular today. It's just part of the culture that we live in. Well, in Galatians, we're observing Paul as a defender of truth. He does not uh, misrepresent what his opponents are teaching. He doesn't tell lies about them. He just very plainly and directly speaks to their errors. What you see about Paul is in his everyday teaching, he gently is, is patient in his speaking, but when, when truth is being attacked, Paul is much more for, forceful. Words are much more blunt because Paul understood when it comes to defending God's truth, truth is worth fighting for no matter how costly, no matter how unpopular that stand may be. Now, I'm, I'm no Paul. I'm certainly not making that claim, and I recognize that sometimes I speak uh, too harshly, even though it's hard for me to imagine being more harsh or forceful than Paul. But I want to tell you this morning, and I think you understand if you've been here very long, I believe that it is critical for us to distinguish between sound doctrine and error, and we are compelled as followers of Christ to defend timeless, changeless truth in a society of situational truth. I have prayed for over 30 years as I pray for my, uh, my children each week and now my grandchildren for over 30 years when, when I pray for godly wisdom, I pray that God will make clear to them and make it very distinguishing right and wrong black and white, because we live in a gray, very gray society. We live in a society where there, where, that says there is no absolute truth, there's no right and wrong. And so we need to pray for our children to see that, to understand that, and then to have the courage to stand on truth. Well, the truth that Paul is dealing with here in Galatians and, and that we're studying is on the doctrine of justification, that we are justified by faith alone. And just to give you another facet, I know we've talked about this for several weeks now, just to give you another facet of the doctrine of justification, let me say it this way, justification does not occur because a person's nature has changed. Justification is a change in status, and from that change in status, you should see a change in nature. God doesn't justify us because we have changed, because our nature has changed. Romans 5, 8, Paul said that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we had changed, not because anything was different in our attitude, our relationship toward God, but God chose to justify us. It's simply a declaration about a believer. It's what God declares about you. When you come to faith in Christ, it's not based on your nature, it's based on the nature of his son and the change in nature, the change in character comes after justification. See, you're made right with God by placing your faith in in what the son has done, what Jesus did on the cross and what the father has promised and then after you've been declared right with God, your character is changed by a work of the Spirit, and we call that work of the Spirit, that change in care, we call it sanctification. And so sanctification, I want you to understand this morning, does not initiate justification. You don't try to begin working on yourself and cleaning yourself up and doing good things and trying to be respectful toward God and attending church. You don't do all those things to be justified. Sanctification does not 
initiate justification. Sanctification is an indication that justification has occurred. Let me say that again to make very clear. If you claim to be a follower of Christ, sanctification is an indication that justification has occurred. If you say that you're a follower of Christ, so you place your faith and trust in Christ, it ought to be evident in your life because there ought to be a process of sanctification occurring. Your nature should be changing. Let me give you a real simple example from marriage. At the end of a wedding ceremony, you'll hear the pastor say, by the authority vested in me by the state of Arkansas as the minister of the gospel, blah, 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 I pronounce you to be man and wife. Now, at the moment he makes that pronouncement, at that instant, that couple moves immediately from being an engaged couple to being husband and wife. But at that exact moment, nothing inside of them actually changes at the moment the declaration is made. Well, nothing except the man becomes extremely fearful. (laughs) I'm just saying that from experience. Nothing changes. You need to be careful, sir. You who are clapping, you need to be careful. (laughs) Nothing changes at the moment the declaration is made, but there's going to be change, right? I'm not going to comment further on that, but following that declaration, there's going to be change, and there should be change. You can't just have the title man and wife or husband and wife and call it good. You should be, from that point forward, learning to live and love like a husband or like a wife. So the declaration occurs, and then the change follows. Justification is God's declaration that you're righteous. Why? Because of anything you've done? No, you're righteous because you're in Christ. And then that justification is followed by sanctification where you learn and become empowered to live a righteous life, to be more and more like Christ. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about justification by faith alone. All right, we're in Galatians chapter 2 this morning, and we're going to jump in at verse 11 and go through the end of the chapter. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Cephas, that's Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him, this is Paul speaking, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. That's the party, the Judaizers, who said that it's not just justification by faith, you have to earn the grace of God by keeping the law. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Well, this is kind of a, uh, a dark spot, if you will, on the apostles, on church leadership. It, it's not a very pretty picture for believers, especially leaders, who are supposed to be united. In fact, you wonder, why, why did God even include this? Why did God have Paul record this? Why is this, uh, this fight between Paul and Peter, why is it even important to us today? Well, first of all, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, we've studied the tension that's happening in Galatia between uh, the gospel of grace and the gospel of works. And so for them, this encounter that Paul had with Peter is showing that Paul had authority over, or authority as an apostle. His authority was not given by the apostles. His authority was from God. If Paul did not have authority of, as, of an apostle, he certainly would not have confronted Peter, who was considered the chief of the apostles. No, Paul's authority came from God. He received the gospel by direct revelation. 
He spoke with authority because he spoke for God. And as this happens, Paul is showing the Galatians, as this happens, his authority is validated by this encounter, and so his message is also validated. He's able to tell the Galatians as an apostle who speaks with authority, you can't be listening to these Judaizers. You have to understand your salvation is by grace through faith alone, not works. Now, for us today, just from a practical standpoint, this confrontation reminds us that as believers, we're accountable to one another. We have accountability to one another. And I want to tell you that is true even as leaders. Accountability keeps the leader on course. Accountability helps make sure that the, the, the leader is keeping his life pure, that he's operating in, in integrity. It's important that even leaders are held accountable. When you hear a story, and, and they're, they're out there all the time, when you hear a story of a fallen leader, I'll assure you what you'll discover is a leader who had no accountability. A leader who decided that he was above the rules or above the law. No, the body of Christ has many members and no one is greater than another and every member is accountable to every other member. We're all accountable to one another in this journey of faith as disciples of Christ. We're responsible to one another and to the Lord, but we're responsible to, to grow up in godliness, to live lives that honor him. And any time a member of the body wanders from their commitment, we must confront them and we must bring them back. Now, that's done in a loving way and that's done with compassion. We are called to call each other into accountability in our relation with Christ. Well, let's dig into the text. Here's what's happening. Paul is, in this part of the text, he's telling the Galatians about a situation that occurred when he was in Antioch. And Paul, along with Barnabas and some other men, were pastoring a Gentile church in Antioch. Uh, although Paul, you remember we saw last week, he never looked for the approval of men. You remember that he had gone to Jerusalem, um, not seeking the approval of the apostles, but God had sent them there. He'd gone to Jerusalem for a visit. And while there, if you look back up in chapter 2 and verse 9, while he's there in Jerusalem, um, he tells Peter and James and John what he is doing, the gospel message he is preaching with the Gentiles, and they affirm him. They affirm the message. They affirm his ministry to the Gentiles, which was to deliver the message of the gospel that justification comes by grace alone and not works. And in chapter, in chapter 2 and verse 9, it says they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. Hey, how many of you are old enough, you grew up in a church that when someone joined your church after the service, you gave them the right hand of fellowship. Y'all remember that? Okay, well, what was the right hand of fellowship? In giving Paul the right hand of fellowship, it, it, it signified their acceptance and their agreement and their trust in him. When we would give a new member to our church the right hand of fellowship, we would say, we're with you. We accept you as a member of our body. We trust you to be a faithful member of our body. We're going we're gonna to agree with you and serve the Lord together. So when they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship, they were saying they accepted Paul as a minister of the gospel, joining with them. It, they were saying they were affirming him and affirming his message. So Paul has gone to Jerusalem, not seeking their approval, but, but receiving full approval from the apostles there, from the three mainly. And now he's in Antioch in this story he's telling. Peter has come for a visit. And he stays for a while. There's nothing unusual about that. The apostles would go out and visit the churches and, and check on them and see how they were doing. And so Peter's been in Antioch. He's probably been there for a while, enjoying the time with Paul and Barnabas. Peter is here in a Gentile city, Antioch. He's, he's uh, engaged in a Gentile church. And he had no problem fellowshipping with the Gentile believers. He had no problem hanging out with them. He had no problem sharing a meal with them. He accepted the Gentiles as brothers in Christ. He understood they were not, not any less than the Jews, not any different in the eyes of God than the Jewish believers. And so Peter fellowshiped with them, and, and his fellowship indicated he accepted them as fellow believers. His fellowship with them indicated that he knew they were not required to keep the law. They were saved by grace, as all of us are. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Not enough merit, not enough good works. We're saved by grace. Now, Paul says that Peter was eating with the Gentiles. That was a huge thing for a Jewish believer to share a meal with a Gentile believer. They, did, they didn't eat with the Gentiles. They didn't share the same utensils. They didn't eat the same food. In fact, a, a good Jew would not even be in the same room with a Gentile. 
To socialize with the Gentiles was forbidden in Jewish culture because the Gentiles were unclean. But evidently, Peter had no problem eating regular meals and even sharing the Lord's Supper with the Gentiles. Until verse 12. Certain men came from James. Who was James? James was head of the Jerusalem church. And as you would imagine, the Jerusalem church was primarily a Jewish congregation. And these men came saying they were from James. They were Judaizers. You've heard that term before in our study of Galatians. They were teaching a corrupt gospel of grace plus works. They said, yes, uh, we have grace from God. That's why we're saved. But the way we get that grace is we keep the law. And these men claim to have been sent by James. It's unlikely that James sent them because, again, going back to verse 9, James was one of the three who affirmed Paul and his message when he visited Jerusalem. James would not have sent these men to cause conflict or to corrupt the gospel. But verse 12, Paul says that Peter feared the circumcision party. That's referring to the, the law keepers, the Judaizers. What was he worried about? Well, he's worried that word might get back to James or word might get back to uh, some of the other uh, Jewish leaders that he was associating so closely with the Gentiles. He was worried that they might um, question his reputation, his integrity with the gospel. He's worried about losing popularity with the Jews, and he's worried about his reputation, going to protect his reputation. So verse 12 says he drew back and he separated himself. Now, his drawing back, in the Greek there, it's a very gradual thing. It's almost sneaky. He just starts kind of avoiding some of the Gentiles. He, he stops eating with them, and then he becomes very aloof and, and has nothing to do with them. He didn't want the Jews to see him with the Gentiles, but he didn't want the Gentiles to see him shunning them. So he's kind of playing both sides of the field here. And unfortunately, Peter wasn't the only one who sinned against his Gentile brothers. Following the lead of Peter, Paul says the rest of the Jews, that's the Jewish believers who were there in Antioch and a part of the church, and even Barnabas follows Peter's lead. And so verse 13, Paul says they're guilty of hypocrisy. What does that mean? It means they're two-faced. It means they're deceitful. Why was it hypocrisy? It was hypocrisy because they knew the true gospel. They knew what was true and right. And that they were playing both sides of the fence there, not only with the Gentile believers who knew they were saved by grace alone, but also with the Judaizers who said, well, you have to work, you have to earn the grace of God. And here's even Barnabas. Barnabas is a champion of Gentile freedom. Barnabas is one of the, the co-pastors of this Gentile church, but even Barnabas follows Peter's lead and, and he's caught up in this hypocrisy. Not only is it hypocrisy, but their actions are an attack on the doctrine of salvation. Without uttering a single word, what Peter has done is caused confusion and division in the church. By his actions, he is siding with those who teach salvation by works. Now, I imagine probably most of us in this room at some point or another have experienced uh, being shunned to some degree. Maybe you've been at a social event, had a, a person that you considered a person of particular significance pay attention to you and and act like they valued you until someone else comes in the room. Then you're dropped. Well, what did Peter do? Not only did he shun and devalue the Gentiles personally, but his actions, remember, Peter is perceived as the chief of the apostles. His actions could actually cause them to question their faith, to wonder if it's actually true that you can be saved by grace alone, to wonder if God truly accepted them. Verse 14, Paul states the primary issue here. Here's the, the crux of the problem. Their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. The Greek word there where, where we translate not in step is the word orthopedeo. You might recognize that word. The word is two words. It's the word ortho, which means straight or upright, and pedeo or pod, foot. So what, what Paul is saying is they weren't walking straight. They weren't walking upright. They weren't uh, walking in line with the truth of the gospel. And Peter knows better. If anyone knew better in that setting, it was Peter. He had a direct revelation from God regarding the Gentiles. You see, this, this encounter Paul's describing in Antioch actually happened after what we see in Acts chapter 10. Hold your finger there in Galatians and turn over very quickly to Acts chapter 10. You probably remember the story. I'm just going to scan 
through the chapter very quickly. In Acts 10, there is a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius lives in Caesarea, and Cornelius was a man who loved God. He prayed to God fervently. He was, a, he was a God-fearer, although he didn't know the Lord God personally. And God, looking on Cornelius, wanted to make himself known. And so he tells Cornelius in a vision to send for this man named Peter. He's at the house of Simon the Tanner in Joppa. So Cornelius sends some men to Peter. Meantime, Peter is in Simon's house, and it's about time for lunch, and Peter goes up on the roof, and he falls into a trance. And you remember the story, three times in his trance, in this vision, a sheet is lowered, and it is filled with unclean animals, animals the Jews were not allowed to eat. And three times Peter is told to eat, and he says, no, no, and Lord, I I can't, these things are unclean. And God says to him, Verse 15, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And so God is giving a message to Peter. He's divinely revealing to Peter that things that God has made are not unclean. And so the men come from Cornelius and they knock on Simon's door and they tell Peter who they are, ask him to go with them. He goes with them. Let me just point out two more things real quick from chapter 10. When Peter gets to Cornelius' house... He goes outside, Cornelius has gathered a large group of people, and he says to them, verse 28, you are well aware it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. And further on in the chapter, in verse 34, he says, I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. He accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And many of those gathered at Cornelius' house came to faith. What kind of faith? Justification by faith alone. And they were baptized. So so Peter had direct revelation from God that Gentiles could receive the gospel and could be accepted by faith. And Peter acted on this. He embraced them as equals. He acknowledged that God accepted all men who fear him and do what is right. So Peter knew that happened in Acts 10. That happened before what we're reading here in Galatians 2. And Peter's hypocrisy threatened Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. So what does Paul do? Verse 14, he confronts Peter before them all he doesn't pull them aside privately he doesn't pull them aside quietly there's certainly a time and place for that in fact I'll tell you most of the most of the church discipline that happens in this church is done that way it's not done in a public way it's not necessary but if we find a fellow believer who's getting into sin and getting involved in sin and bringing destruction to their lives we we pull them aside and and we talk to them but not, not in this case, what Peter did was a public sin. Many people had seen it. And that public sin required public condemnation and correction. And so Paul pulls him aside. He, he tells Peter, look, your behaviors cause confusion. And then in front of everyone, he tells all of those present exactly what has happened because everyone needed to hear not just the correction of Peter, but the affirmation of the true gospel message. Now, you you see here, Peter didn't come right out and say, I don't believe the true gospel. It was his actions that were compromising the gospel message. A person doesn't have to come right out and say, well, I I don't really believe the true gospel, but how they live and what they do their, their words and, and actions, if you're a believer, if they don't line up with the gospel, then confusion is going to be the natural result if people know that you claim faith in Christ. So the integrity of the gospel is brought into question. And the important thing for us to remember today from this passage is we don't want to say or do anything that would confuse the message of the true gospel. Are, are we walking in a straight line? Are we walking upright? Are we walking in line with the message of the gospel? And so in verse 14, Paul tells Peter, look, you've been living like the Gentiles. You've been eating what they eat. You've been treating them as equals in Christ. And now all of a sudden you're going to say they have to be like the Jews. They have to keep the law to be accepted. Verse 15 and 16, you see that Paul calls the Gentiles Gentile sinners. Now the word sinner was very derogatory in their day. And to say Gentile sinners is really to put down the Gentiles. Paul's not 
not saying this because he believes it personally. He's using this sarcastic remark about how the Jews look down on the Gentiles and how they thought the Gentiles were grossly immoral. He's using that to get Peter's attention to compare the Gentiles with the Jewish believers. He's drawing a contrast between the Gentile religion and the Jewish religion. What do we know about the Jews? Well, we know that the Jews worship one God. They fasted, they prayed, they, they gave alms, they kept God's law. And God's law is what helped them to live with restraint. And in contrast, the Gentiles live without restraint. They had many gods, and their gods, uh, their worship was immoral. They had temples that were filled with prostitutes. But Paul is telling Peter, look, despite the contrast in our religion, in our lifestyles, verse 16, Peter, you know we were not justified by keeping the law. We Jews thought we were better than the Gentile sinners, but we stood condemned before God, condemned before God just like the Gentiles. Yeah, Peter, they're Gentile sinners, but guess what? We were Jewish sinners. Our heart wasn't changed by keeping the law because we're not justified by the law, but we're justified by faith in Christ. Why is that? Because Christ died for our law-breaking. Christ paid the penalty. The penalty for our law-breaking was death. He paid the penalty for our law-breaking, and we're only justified by putting our confidence in what he has done, not what we're going to do or what, what we can do. And that truth is true for all men then and now. And, and let me pause here and say this to be very clear. When I talk about faith in Jesus, I'm not talking about just agreeing with the facts about Jesus, agreeing that he was God's son, agreeing that he, he lived and died. Faith in Jesus is complete commitment, complete surrender to the lordship of Christ. That's what it means to have faith in Jesus. Three times in verse 16, Paul states, we are justified by faith in Christ not by works. Three times he says in that one verse. Now look at verse 17. It might seem confusing, but basically what Paul is saying here, listen, if we were trusting Christ alone for salvation, which is exactly what Jesus taught us, Jesus himself told us we had to trust in him alone. So if we're trusting him alone, and then we find out we're still sinners because we haven't been keeping the law, then Jesus would be the one who led us into sin, wouldn't he? If Jesus told us we're to trust him alone, but then we find out we're still sinners because we haven't kept the law, then it's on him he led us into sin. What does Paul say? Certainly not. And it's very emphatic in the grief. No, 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 not possible. Christ could never be a promoter of sin. What he said is absolutely true. Salvation comes by faith in Christ alone. Verse 18, what is it that, that's torn down? The false system of salvation by works. Paul says, look, we, we tore that down. If you go back and, and rebuild it, then you're back in sin. You're rebuilding a system of, of legalism, of earning merit and grace. Your relationship with God is not through the law. It is through Christ. And then verse 20, it's just a great definition of what it means to be a Christian. It's a picture of what takes place at the moment of salvation, and it's a pattern for how we live once we are saved. Look what he says in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, obviously, he's not talking literally and physically. It is, it is symbolic. It's a symbolic phrase for a spiritual truth, and that is this. Christ died to pay the penalty for my sin, breaking the curse of the law as a believer because I'm in him. The penalty has been paid for me, so I am no longer under the judgment of the law. I'm dead to the law. It, it, it can't condemn me. But then Christ rose. He declared victory over the law and over sin, and I rose with him because I'm in Christ. I'm victor victorious over the law, over sin, and he empowers me to live for him. I'm able to live in a way that pleases God. As Paul's saying, what's made a difference in me is not what I've done. What's made a difference in me, the reason I'm a different man is because Christ lives in me. Paul's not saying the law doesn't matter. You can come to Christ and live however you want to live. He's saying, look, my relationship with Christ is what causes me to want to please him, to love him, to honor him, to worship him with my life. So that obedience is genuine. The Jews were just keeping the law. It was just ritual. It meant nothing to them. Paul's saying my obedience, being in Christ, is genuine. It's from the heart. I'm not just trying to keep external rules. My desire is to truly live for him. 
I don't have to keep the law to earn God's favor. But because God has shown me grace, I have no desire to live lawlessly. Let me say that again, because there are people that err on both sides. There are people who think they have to work to earn the grace of God. There are people who think, well, because salvation is by grace through faith alone, I can get saved, and it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I live. No, that's not what we learn from Scripture. We don't have to keep the law to earn God's favor, but because God has given us favor, because he has shown us grace, we should have no desire to live lawlessly. We're to live to please him. Paul wraps it up in verse 21. Just another reminder, if you're going to try to earn your salvation by being good enough, then you make Christ's death meaningless. If we could be good enough, if we could do enough good things, if we could earn enough uh, merit, then Christ didn't have to die. You, you could get grace from your own worthiness and from your own works. What's the point of Christ dying? No, Paul would say, I need Christ. You need Christ. Every man, woman, boy, and girl needs Christ. There, there is no hope apart from him. We are completely dependent on the grace of Christ. We must be, verse 20, we must be in Christ, and Christ must be in us. That's the message of the gospel. Now, what is this, what is this little argument between Paul and Peter? What is all this mean for us today? How do we apply the truth here from Galatians 2, 11 through 21? Well, there are three things. And the first one, very simply, is this. We have to be clear and confident about our faith. There can be no confusion. Justification comes through faith by grace. No other way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. We have to be clear and confident about the foundation of our faith. And in that, in being clear and confident, we have to be consistent and not compromising. We need to be careful with not only our speech but also our actions. We need to be consistent around everyone. We need to be the same around people out in the world, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our school, just exactly the same as we are around fellow believers. We need to be courageous. We need to be willing to, to speak up. We need to speak the truth to those who are believing a false gospel. And we also need to speak up, we need to speak to fellow believers who are compromising the gospel by the way that they live. They're confusing unbelievers, we need to speak up. We need to call them into accountability. That's our calling as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's our calling as the body of Christ. That one part of the body is not doing their part, the other parts of the body come. And they speak truth, and they bring healing. 